We're gonna do the swern. The swern. The swern. Swern. Oxidation. Let's try it with a secondary alcohol. So the key here is we're trying to turn a secondary alcohol into a ketone. We're, we're recording now. Right. So we need to have a carbon, right, that has an available H. Right. So at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're losing this H and oxidizing this carbon. The hard part with all this is how we go about doing that. Right. And so we have a couple reagents that we use before we even add the alcohol. We have to do like a premix essentially. And the reagents we use are DMSO. There are some easier ways, right? So, like, actually in lab doing this isn't that hard. The mechanism is complicated, but actually doing this in lab isn't that hard. It's actually easy to clean up the products. That's why this is nice, right? This one smells horrible, but that's how you know it's done. It's easy to clean up. You can, you can get rid of that stuff. So, yeah, mechanistically it looks really hard. In lab, it's actually not that hard at all. So that's part of the reason why. It's, the part of it's charm, right? Are you doing this in lab? No, we're not doing this. We're not doing this in lab. We need this oxalic chloride, right? So a question I could ask would be like, if you saw this oxalic chloride, what is oxalic chloride? Is that a pretty strong electrophile? This guy right here, these carbons? Is that a pretty good electrophile? Yeah. Yeah, a really good electrophile, right? Because DMSO is usually a solvent, right? This is usually a solvent. So to get a solvent to react with something, it has to be pretty reactive, right? So you have the negative charge there. Attack. The DMSO is the nucleophile, that's right. We form a tetrahedral intermediate. Right? These electrons come down, we kick out the chloride. Who remembers what the whole point of this to do was? Though? What are we trying to get on? So we're trying to change. DMSO, right? We're trying to change that to have a good leaving group on it, right? So right now, is O minus a good leaving group? No, right? So at the end of the day, we, what we want to get on there is a good leaving group. Aren't you also I'm trying to get the, well, like the DMSO to where? Yep, we're trying to get the DMSO to essentially be the electrophile, right? It's delta plus right now. And we Can just, you just made Cl minus. At this point, we've turned our sulfur into a good electrophile, right? It's attached to a good leaving group. So now our chlorine can come back in and attack the S. These electrons can go here. We're going to lose CO2. These electrons go to that oxygen, towards that oxygen, and the oxygen or the carbon chlorine bond also breaks. So what we end up with here is Wait, those electrons in between two O carbon to oxygen bond. W O where? So the electrons right here go towards there, and this is the CO2 piece. These two electrons go towards the oxygen, forming that CO carbon monoxide, and then this carbon chlorine bond breaks and the chlorine just leaves. So we end up with CO2 plus CO plus Cl minus. But I don't get it. Exactly how all of this stuff would happen. Like the chlorine is leaving, the oxygen is kicking down its electrons. Right, so, so, so this looks like a lot that's going on, right? But look at these products. Again, what are the products? This product is a, they're all gases. If you lose a gas, is it ever coming back into solution? Yeah. Right, the gases don't come back in solution. So all it takes is, if this chlorine can just find this sulfur, then this chain reaction happens, and it's done. Okay, so that arrow that's between the S and the O, is that going into that C? Because doesn't that yes. C have to come out of the then, then this electrons break for that C. So this is the C of the CO2. Yeah, but if that C doesn't go with that O, then won't it go with the O? No, that's just the C for the CO. This is the C for the CO. Yeah. This C and this C are the same. Oh, so that's the first thing is the CO2. Yep, good. Okay. And then we use it as the CO's. 
so now we're taking, now we're going to take this activated sulfur complex on, right? So now we're in the position where, right, if we're going to oxidize this carbon, at the end of the day, we have to reduce something. What we reduce is the sulfur, right? And so now, all right, so I'll bar this off a little bit. These electrons come here, the oxygen's electrons. The oxygen is going to attack the sulfur. Oops. Back off. Just start a new slide, it's just easier. All right, sulfur with a good leaving group. The chlorine, yep, sulfur is a good leaving group chlorine. It kicks that out. Sulfur, sulfur plus charge plus Cl minus. Right. Remember we had in there triethylamine, we haven't used that yet. Triethylamine is just a base that we can use to help shuttle these protons around. There should be a plus charge in this oxygen. I know you guys are going to correct me on that really quick. Okay. Takes that proton, goes back there. We still need to do at the end of the day, right? We need to lose a hydrogen off of this carbon, right? So we got to make sure we remember to do that. I'll show you again. Right? This hydrogen. Right? So another molecule of triethylamine will come in. You obviously have to have more than one equivalent. Yep, has to be two of those. This is the final point where this carbon gets oxidized and then the sulfur gets reduced. It gets these electrons back. That's when it makes that really smelly stuff. The dimethyl sulfide. This is how it stinks. The final product then, of course, is the ketone. So, Mitsunobu. The important parts of Mitsunobu are The important parts, the major point is you can invert stereochemistry. That's the biggest take home message. Right. Again, these multi step mechanisms, a lot of times what happens is you have to like you have you have to stir the reagents for a while by themselves before you add in the actual substrate you want to have a reaction on. So the biggest thing about Mitsunobu is you invert stereochemistry. You have something that's R, you end up getting an S. Something that's S ends up being R. So that's a really useful technique. Basically, the, the whole rigmarole of Mitsunobu, though, is the hard part is OH is not a good leaving group by itself, right? So since OH is not a good leaving group, we have to activate it somehow to add in a different OH. So the whole process here is essentially figure out a way to activate this alcohol to be a good leaving group. That's it. Mm -hmm. right? So the way we do that is with right, the benzoic acid... And the dead. The dead. And I can simplify dead by just being R groups. R groups, right? And we have to have a little bit of triphenylphosphine. And we said triphenylphosphine, right, ends up turning into triphenylphosphine oxide in most of these mechanisms. So triphenylphosphine gets, or the phosphine gets oxidized. I mean, something else gets reduced. Huh? Yeah, that's one of the last things that gets in there. There's some other things you can use. Dead just works nice because, again, it's, a lot of this, again, it's just easier to work up the reaction, right? So a lot of these things, the mechanism is really complicated, but working up with dead is just, it's just more convenient. So it's, an, you can, it's aqueous, so you can wash it away. So it's just a convenience thing, really, at the end of the day. It's not a rhodium. It's fennel, right? It's fennel. My bad. Hmm. 
trying to erase, but I won't. Okay. So the whole beginning part is you put in essentially the benzoic acid, benzoic acid, and the dead in together. The dead has a lone pair on the nitrogen. Benzoic acid is an acid. So you can protonate your dead. You're going to bring your dead back to life. <laughs> so you get your carboxylate, which comes in play later on. You get your activated dead. Your dead has been activated. Right At this point, when you've activated your dead, the triphenylphosphine can come in and attack. Again, right, we're doing all this stuff to get this, essentially get the alcohol member at the very beginning to be a good leaving group. Right? We've got, we got to create a reagent that turns this into a good leaving group. That's all we're doing here. Got our dead activated. Our dead at goes attacked. Oops. Nope. 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 Make sure you balance our charge. It has to be a plus charge here. Right on the phosphorus. Now the phosphorus got an extra bond. At this point, our carboxylate comes back in, mm. attacks the phosphorus. Right, which would leaves. So we're very close to having our activated phosphorus here. Actually, we have activated our phosphorus now. We have our dead is essentially all our dead now is is a strong base. Is that negative charge now for before? Right? So th it's at this point that we add our alcohol, right? So now we have our strong base, which will deprotonate our alcohol. When we deprotonate our alcohol, now we have the good electrophile phosphorus and a good leaving group. Right? So let's just do that, draw those in really quick. Everybody can see that nitrogen with a negative charge is a pretty strong base. It's going to deprotonate our alcohol. Or, well, I'm not going to do it there. I'm just going to do it here. Our alcohol now is a good nucleophile. O minus, right? Now the O minus can attack the phosphorus. And that gives us finally essentially our starting material alcohol with a good leaving group on it. So then you're back just doing a normal SN2? And now you're stuck just doing an SN2. Yep. So once you get to this point, and I'm sorry I got lost a little bit here. Let me backtrack. Got our Phosphorus activated from here with our carboxylate, strong base, deprotonates our starting material alcohol. That O minus can attack the phosphorus, kick back there, right, from that carboxylate. And now we've what have we done? Our mission's been accomplished, right? We have a good leaving group, right? Oxygen bond to phosphorus is a good leaving group, right? And then we just throw in whatever actually whatever nucleophile you want to throw in, you can have attack now. So if you put in OH minus, fine. Have it attack. You can put any nucleophile you want in at this point. Well, benzene's not a nucleophile. That's not a good enough nucleophile. Like you can say O-methoxide you could put in and have it attack. All right? You can invert the stereochemistry here. So in this case, we would have put in OH minus, OH minus comes in, kicks out, and you get the product. Do you have that charge You still have this carboxylate too, so that could do the same thing. Go. All right. E1 C B versus E2. So how do you know if E1CB is happening versus E2? So what you'll see in a lot of these things is you'll have a leaving group, 
in the beta position. We'll talk about that. Right? Alpha and beta. Right? Alpha and beta. So you have a leaving group in the beta position. And this can either, and you end up getting the same product. You get the alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. Right? Doesn't have to be from the same mechanism, though. So E1CB goes through an intermediate, right? So OH minus is the same thing for both. So I'll put OH minus on both, so strong base. Can that be really bulky so it's like It depends, right? I mean, it's a generic base. That will affect it for sure, right? So this is just going to form, E1CB, you form an enolate. Right. E1CB, you form an enolate. And then what happens is these electrons come down, pi bond moves over, and we kick out the good leaving group. And that gets us to the product. Right? Get the same product, the same product different mechanism. Right? So great question. Why is this called E1? Is because the elimination step only involves one molecule. One molecule. And it's the conjugate base. Elimination <laughs> with unimolecular, right? Co one. And then CB stands for conjugate base, right? See how this enolates the conjugate base of this ketone? No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's an acid that's base. Yep. Now, the other thing that could happen is just straight up E2. Straight up E2. Straight up E2. And what, what do you need for E2, though? There needs to be a specific geometry needs to be anti-periplanar, right? E2, you need to be anti-periplanar. And if you're not, can you do E2? No. No. So remember there's an example I showed you in class where just because of the way the ring was, the leaving group and that H weren't anti-periplanar, so you could not do E2. You had to do E1CB. Had to be 180 anti player. Remember, anti periplanar means 180 degrees apart. So you need to have the leaving group and the H 180 degrees apart. Remember, because these electrons need to go to sigma star, right? Yep. Right. So what happens here? OH minus comes here, right? Here's sigma star, right? If I put electron density in somebody's antibody order, what happens? You break their bonding orbital, and then leaving group goes. So to do E2, you need that anti-periplanar relationship. So if you can't have anti-periplanar, you can't have E2. So Yeah, so how are you going to be able to tell the difference between these new me two mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. One of them has an intermediate, right? So what could you add in here to see if, that, if, this, if this intermediate exists, what could you add in to see possibly to prove its existence? You could add in an acid, but that's just going to put an H there and bring us back to here, right? Oh, yeah. you could, what other things? Could, oh, acid is an electrophile or nucleophile? Electrophile. So what if you put in any other electrophile? Right? Well, couldn't, well, couldn't, yeah. this, couldn't this enolate react with another electrophile? Mm. Yeah. And the, it, even if you formed one of these molecules, that would, that would prove the existence of this thing, right? Right? Because you, cause all of a sudden, if you said, if I put in okay. E+, plus, right? This is going to come down, and this is going to attack that E plus, and I form a different product. So e it's just a so generic that? electrophile, okay. oh. right? So all I'm saying is that because this E1CB has an intermediate, one of the ways to strengthen the argument for that mechanism is to trap that intermediate with another electrophile, right? Because this is a nucleophile. So if you can prevent this elimination from happening and having it this pi bond attack something else, you can at least prove that it exists. Eliminate. That you put in there and sure. Yeah. So I mean, that, this is just very. I mean, I'm just being like. like an yeah. I'm just. Do, yeah. I'm just saying like. Yeah. So it'd be, I'm not saying this would be easy or practical, but this is just saying what if I asked you that question, could you could you answer something like that? How do you how what's one way you could differentiate between these two mechanisms, right? E two has to be anti periplanar. That's one way. E one C B has an intermediate. 
right? How could you, if you could prove, someone prove the existence of that intermediate, that would, that would lead to you believing that mechanism is probably happening. 